Let me just uh, uh, invite us to take our Bibles this morning, and would you look with me in Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. It, it just struck me as we were watching some of those pictures that we've been talking about how to bless our neighbors and uh, what that looks like in sharing God's love. And you'll remember with me that whole idea of it begins with prayer and uh, we listen with care and compassion. And today we're going to look at what it means to eat together, okay? Uh, all part of blessing our neighbors. And did we not see that modeled for us just a moment ago? Uh, blessing neighbors. This is what we're growing. We'd like to share with you and neighbors sharing back and so forth. Well, we're going to look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 13, where it talks about practicing uh, hospitality. And uh, as we begin that here this morning, just stop for a moment and think with me. When, when we have people that we might have over to our home, sometimes we use language like this. Uh, um, wh what are you doing today? Well, I'm entertaining guests. Well, that's awesome. You know, I'm entertaining guests. Uh, these ones happen to live in the neighborhood. Do you know the difference between entertaining and hospitality? Entertaining and, and hospitality, what's the difference? Karen Maines has written something about this, and this is what she says. She says, when it comes to entertainment, she says, entertainment says this, this house is mine. It's an expression of my personality, and so I want you to like my house, look at my house, admire my house, because as you do that, you admire me. Hospitality says, this home is a gift from the Lord, and I simply want to share it with you. It's his gift and his home. And Taman says, I want to impress you with my house, my clever decorating, my incredible cooking, and those kinds of things. You know, I'm going to go find something on Pinterest, or maybe it's Instagram or whatever, but we're going to find something to impress our guests. Hospitality, on the other hand, says, I just want to enjoy your presence. And I want you to taste and see that God is good. Jen Wilkins has written on this topic as well. And, and just stop and think with me about, sometimes we get caught up in this, don't we? When it's time to, quote, entertain guests. It's all about what we've set before them. We've got this perfect tablescape. We've gone to Pinterest, found that right thing. And there's a menu that impresses. And it's every step and stage. And the house has to look spotless. And everything's picked up. And every throw pillow's in its place. And every cobweb's being eradicated. And, and uh, we just want it to be perfect. And, and it becomes, everything's about that. That's entertainment. Hospitality says, you know, I'm going to pick up. I want you to be comfortable. I want you to be a part of our home. I want you to feel welcome. But I'm not worried about the dust in the corner over there. And I'm not worried that it doesn't all look quite perfect. And uh, there's going to be a few places in my house that looks like a mess. But that's okay. But the main room right here where we're going to sit, it's presentable. It's okay. And basically what I want you to know is that you matter. I want to know what you're thinking and feeling, and I want to know you as a person, and, and it's about you and, and the opportunity I have to share the love of Jesus with you. I want to offer that kind of hospitality, being hospitable. It's really not about the entertaining part. Not about you, but we've got caught in that cycle sometimes where it's just about so worried about what somebody thinks about you or what they think about your home, and that reflects on you, versus that I'm just concerned for you as a person, and and I want for you to get to know us, and we want to get to know you and build relationship because you matter to God. You're made in his image, and, and we want to do this together. There's a great difference between that. And so when the scripture says practice hospitality, Romans 12, 13, um, that portion of scripture, by the way, it's not a suggestion. It's not the, well, I can follow it if I want to or not. No, it's an imperative. It's a command. It says, practice hospitality. In fact, the New Living Translation says, be eager to practice hospitality. And the word hospitality literally means to show love to strangers. That's the literal translation of that in the Greek. To show love to strangers, to, to make them feel welcome in our homes because we want to bless them. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 34, it says there that the foreigner residing among you should be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself because you are foreigners in Egypt. And I am the Lord your God and, and the Lord has redeemed his people. He said, there was a time when you were a stranger and I provided that which you needed and I brought you to be with myself. He says, on the basis of that, I want you to turn and offer hospitality and love to those who are strangers to you and welcome them into your home. 
And, and that's something that God wants to build into us so deeply. And so you might remember with me that Christ himself talked about this kind of hospitality in Matthew chapter 25. You remember that picture where, where the king is on the throne and, and he's separating sheep and goats. And, and he says concerning the sheep, he says, listen, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was a stranger and you invited me in. What is that? You showed me hospitality. And in showing that hospitality to our neighbors, to those around us, we're actually showing that same love to Jesus, even as you pour that out for those who are strangers to us or we don't know that well yet. Christ lets us know that that's a vitally important thing. And in fact, if you go on to Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about, so I was a stranger and you didn't let me in, right? Who were the goats? They were the people that they took that, which is practical expressions of love and blessing and didn't go there and refused to go there. Jesus says, this is the difference between sheep and goats. This is the difference between my people who love me and are responding to others with that same love and those who might give voice service to something, but they didn't go through and follow through, do the things that I've called them to. We want to bless our neighbors. We Remember, we talked about blessing begins with prayer. It talks about listening well. We talked about that last week and listening with care, compassion, listening with our, our heart and our eyes and our ears and all those different ways of listening, right? Um, but as we come to this passage in Romans 12, 13, what the scripture is saying is, this is a lifestyle. Okay, this is a life to say practice hospitality suggests that that's the fabric of our life. It's a lifestyle. It's not just a momentary thing saying, you know, I think we'll have company over this week and we do it once every, you know, do you know what a blue moon is? Okay. This is a blue moon month, by the way. There are two super moons, August 1st and at the end of August. Once in a blue moon, moon means it happens rarely. Like the next time this is going to happen, two blue moons in a month, like it is now 14 years from now. That's a blue moon, okay? The scripture's not talking about that when it comes to hospitality. Say, no, make this a lifestyle. This is a part of how you live. And so it's there constantly and all the time. If you look in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 18, in Genesis 18, Abraham is out sitting in front of his tent. And picture with me, it's a, it's a hot day in the Middle East. And uh, he's out, he's found some shade, and he's there. And he's just kind of, it's kind of midday. And, and suddenly there's visitors that are coming by, three strangers. Never met them before, but here they are. And what does Abraham do? If you're to look in Genesis 18, you discover as you read that story that he, he goes and he invites them to come. Would you sit in this shady spot and, and can I provide you with some water? And, and then he takes initiative and he says, oh, and would you share a meal with us? We'd love for you to share a meal with us. And when they agree to, to that meal, then he goes to Sarah and he says, Sarah, we've got guests and uh, would you make some bread for them and uh, let's provide a fine meal. So he takes a, a young calf, one of the best that he has, and he has it killed so that he can barbecue, right? And, he, and he's just doing all of that as an expression of this is what we do when we have uh, others come and we express hospitality to them. And for Abraham, it's just such a natural thing. And what was fascinating, when you read through Genesis 18, those three visitors represent Father, Son, Holy Spirit, represent God himself. And, and as Abraham responded to them, he received, and he's blessing them, there was unexpected blessing that came to him. In fact, he was told, listen, within a year, the promise God made all those years ago about becoming a father and a parent, within a year, that child will be here. There was blessing that returned to Abram, even as he expressed the blessings. God says, I've called you to bless the nations. And, and notice how it happens, even as he expressed hospitality. And so you have Abraham in Genesis chapter 18. In 2, Corinthians 4, uh, 2 Kings 4, rather, there's a, a foreign-born woman that she and her husband are offering hospitality to Elisha, the prophet of God. And, and they recognize that he's been coming and going. And so they say, why don't you come and be with us and share this meal with us? And, and we'd love to prepare a place for you. In fact, she goes up on the roof and she prepares a kind of a room area. And there's a bed and there's some shade there and a table and a chair and a lamp. And, and it says that Elisha agreed to do that. And again, as you move through that story, you would discover that as this woman expresses hospitality as a lifestyle... And she's blessing this person that she doesn't know. She really doesn't know Elisha. But as she blesses him in that way, the Lord actually poured blessing back into her life in unexpected ways. And the Lord blessed her with a child. 
and again. We see this pattern repeated over and over again. You can go to the story of the widow of Zarephath and, and how she ministered to Elijah in a similar way. Uh, you could uh, turn to uh, back all the way back into uh, Joshua and think about Rahab the prostitute and how she opened up her home and her heart to those Jewish spies that were spying out the land. And she made a place for them and said, this is a safe place. And she welcomed them. And these who were strangers became people that became friends to her. And indeed, what happened? Her own life was spared, as was the life of her family. This is a lifestyle. That the pattern is there, and God says to his people and to you and I that he wants us to offer this hospitality as something that we do just constantly as part of a lifestyle of living. Do you remember Jesus had a reputation? What was it? He's a friend of sinners. If you look in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 7, verse 34, it says concerning Jesus, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. There were some people that thought, well, since the people he's with are sinners, uh, big sinners, uh, he's probably doing what they're doing. And so he must be a drunk and a glutton. He just eats too much and drinks too much. They just assumed that. That was not so of Christ. But clearly, he loved to celebrate people by spending time with them around the dinner table. And he expressed hospitality, often as the, uh, the guest that was welcomed uh, to the home. <clears throat> Do you remember Jesus with uh, Zacchaeus up in the tree? What were his words to Zacchaeus? I need to come to your house today. Jesus invited himself over to become the guest and invited Zacchaeus to practice some hospitality. And as he did so, Christ came bringing good news and hope. And the scripture says that today salvation has come to this home. Christ is setting the bar and modeling for us this whole practice of hospitality. You might remember he was the special guest with Matthew in Matthew 9 and verse 10, where Matthew, the tax collector, is agreed to follow Jesus. And so what does he do? He says, I'm going to get my friends over and people that I know. And the scripture says very clearly, these were the sinners and the tax collectors, bigger sinners, all together. And Jesus is there eating with them. Christ was hospitable and practiced hospitality in that way. Indeed, was the object of that hospitality. Remember, Mary and Martha, there was a place for him. What's the pattern in the New Testament? I'm just helping us understand all the way through scripture, we see this Think about hospitality. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says of the early church, what? They broke bread together. It says they devoted themselves to breaking bread together. And there's that sense of breaking bread in this moment means what? Sharing a meal. And it was done daily. And this was the pattern in the early church as well. Uh, again, you can just process other scripture passages. Romans 16 talks about Gaius and how his hospitality was extended to the whole church family. Uh, if you were to look later on in the scripture in 1 John chapter 3, it says there, listen, there's some people that are strangers to you that are representing me. They're representing Christ in the gospel, and they've come to your church, and we ought to respond to these people in what way? Uh, show hospitality to such people, verse 8, so we can work together for the truth. We've had the joy of doing that this week, haven't we? Some of us have spent and had multiple meals with, with our friends from Asia. We've got to share some meals together. And, and we've taken people that we've never met before, and now we're becoming friends. We're getting to know them as we've shared these meals together. It's just doing scripture, isn't it? God's inviting you and I to say, would you practice hospitality as a lifestyle? And it might be fair to ask, so what's the benefit of that? How, how does that do something that matters to the kingdom? Well, it starts by opening hearts and doors to Christ. One of Paul's prayers, as he's writing to the churches, the various churches, right? He, he says, would you pray with me that the Lord would do what? Open doors. Open hearts to respond to the gospel of Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so often what we need to do in that is to invite people to come and share a meal with us in our home. And as we do so, they get to see Christ in action in our home and they get to taste and see that God is good. I know for some of us, this is a, this is a bit of a stretch, isn't it? It's like, well, pastor, yeah, sounds good, but I, I don't do so well with being the hostess or 
you know, I, I, I'm not a great cook, or, you know, there's all kinds of things that we could throw out there at that point. Um, but remember, we're not trying to impress people with our cooking skills. We're not trying to impress people with how neat and tidy our home is. That's not what it's about. Hospitality says, just receive me as I am because I want to receive you as you are. And so I'm willing to not pull out the fine bone china because, frankly, my friends will feel much more comfortable on stoneware, right? And so we'll pull, we'll pull that out. That's okay. Um, we're just making sure that our intent with all of that is not to impress people in some way, but rather to have the Lord open their heart to the good news of Christ. And the way I know to do that is to welcome them in, to take strangers and say, you're welcome in my home and I want you to come and be a part of that. It opens hearts and homes as you continue to practice this as a lifestyle. And notice too that these guests who come as outsiders get to leave as insiders. Have you had that experience where you were the outsider and someone invited you in and you spent time, you built relationship over time and soon they felt like family and you just love being together? And that's that whole thing of hospitality where that outsider becomes an insider. They were a stranger, but now they're a friend. In fact, more than that, they've become like family. That is an incredible picture when that begins to take place, isn't it? When uh, those who are outsiders become insiders. Think about Peter and Cornelius. Peter had to have a sign from heaven that it was okay for Cornelius to invite him to his house and that they could stay in the same house and eat the same food. God had to show Peter something from heaven that all's clean, that God is making all things clean through Christ. And so Peter, it's okay. And then you have Cornelius extend this invitation, Acts chapter 10, and say, I want you to come to our house. And the whole household's there and, and they're sharing things together. What's fascinating is Peter shares Christ. Many of them come to faith in Christ. There's baptism, there's all kinds of things going on. And then the scripture says, and Peter stayed a few more days. The stranger, Peter, has become a friend. An outsider became an insider. Cornelius said, I want you to stay. And he expressed that through hospitality. You and I are invited to take that posture to allow guests to go from being outsiders to insiders. Do you remember Lydia who came to faith in Christ? And as she became a believer, what was the first thing she did? Paul, you got to stay at my house. If I'm really a believer, if I've come to faith in Jesus, then I want you to stay at my house, use the base of operations, and you can do whatever you need to do from here. I just want you to come and be with me. An outsider to an insider. And Paul just expresses that joy in partnering with that church in Philippi of which Lydia was a part and saying, here's what all started. By the way, you'll find the next chapter 16, verse 15. And then there's the joy of sharing the hosting of this meal together. And what I mean by that is, um, typically when we put a meal together, we get a menu and all that kind of stuff, what do we tend to do? Someone says, can I bring something? And what do we say? No, that's okay, I got it, right? I'm planning on serving this, and I got this, and this, and this, and this, right? And, and what would happen if you and I, as we express hospitality and help outsiders become insiders, part of family, someone says, what can I bring? And say, well, would you like to bring a salad? You, you could do this. Oh, could I help you grill right now? And, and we just kind of hand the tongs over and say, yeah, would you like to you know, help grill in that way? What I'm saying is, why would we represent Jesus in such a way that we have all the answers and we have all the stuff and we give everything, and, but we have no needs? Is that a true picture? Frankly, I could use some help with the dishes or cleanup, right? Or cooking or bringing something. And we invite our neighbors to join in that. Did you notice as Andre and Kate were sharing that little bit, there was reciprocal things, right? Back and forth. And that's how that works. So hospitality shares in that. And, and we offer that and extend that to our friends as they come to our home, it's like, well, sure. Would you like to bring this? Is, uh, what is it you'd like to bring? And we give them that opportunity to do those kinds of things. And so that's one of those people, uh, things that really, really matter. And of course, when you're sharing those ways, then you're beginning to share life together. And now you can move into some deeper discussions. 
does this all happen in one instant, one meal? No. Over the course of time, many meals, many times together. And by the way, you know that you're getting into a whole new place in your relationship when they invite you to their house. And it's being reciprocated the other way. And so we look for ways to share life together, don't we? And so maybe it's going to Shakespeare in the Park. Maybe it's going to see a Mustangs game. It's, it's doing some things together, going camping, whatever, right? We're sharing life together, but the, the desire is, I want to be engage, able to engage in conversation. And as you're hearing, him, you're hearing about my life and I'm hearing about your life, we can get to a place where some meaningful conversation begins to happen. And now we're in a place where we begin to share very directly about the love of Christ and what God has done for us in Christ. Remember, we're to do so gently and with uh, respect. 1 Peter 3.15, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's within you with gentleness and respect. Don't forget that last part. It really matters. A gentle spirit, respectful of who that person is, made in the image of God, treasured by God. They may be living a life that is looking nothing like what you would want them to have, but they're not there yet. They're still being brought into relationship with Christ. And let God do those kinds of changes. Your responsibility and mine is to help them taste and see that God is good. So here comes the big question. Luke chapter 14, Jesus is telling a story, talking about a king who's throwing a great banquet. And and the question was, are you gonna show up? Right? The question was, when the invitation is given, are you gonna show up? Now, I understand in that teaching, as Jesus brings that parable, he's talking about kingdom of God. He's talking about people responding to the salvation message of Christ, all that that means. But there's a couple of clues here that might be helpful to us when we think about hospitality this morning. Uh, One of those would be this very important thing, and that is um, be bold in inviting people over. It, It takes a certain amount of boldness and courage to do that. And if you were to look at that story as Jesus tells it and teaches this lesson, he says the king learned that there was still room at the table and it wasn't full yet. So what did he do? Oh, well, I guess we'll just go with who we got. No. He sends his servants out and says, I want every place filled. He was bold and he determined that there'd be people sitting at that table that every place was filled. I think that says something to us about when it comes to practicing hospitality to say, I can be bold in, in continuing to invite, continue to give opportunity, say, we'd just love to have you come. Can we make that work this week? Is there a time that works in your calendar? And we don't take no for an answer, but over time, we're just saying, just love to get some time with you and spend that time. So be bold in that. Christ talks about the fact that the servants came out and they compelled them to come in. And, and that word compel literally means to persuade, to persuade them. It's fascinating because it says in Acts 16 concerning Lydia, she persuaded Paul to accept the hospitality. She had to persuade him. She was bold in that. Secondly, let me suggest that this talks about um, remembering who's also present at the meal. So when you and I have guests that come over, there's more going on than what they might think or see, right? Because they're at the meal, we're at the meal, Who else is enjoying supper with us? Christ. Christ is the unseen host of that meal. Do you remember? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is present. And we want them to experience Christ and know Christ in a very personal way. And so we're reminded that that the king is present and he's part of this meal. And as he's present in that way, we're praying quietly, Lord, would you touch their hearts? Would you open their eyes? Help them to see, help them to recognize this because we care about them as people. And then we watch what God does. As Jesus tells that story in Luke chapter 14, the king has a purpose in what he's doing. He wants these people to be with him for all of eternity. We want these people to be with us for all of eternity. And so in Colossians, it says, make sure your words are seasoned with grace and with salt. Choose your words. Have conversations that relate to Christ and the gospel. And we go there gently and kindly and expressing that love because our desire is that they would know Christ even as we know Christ. Friends, when you and I look at hospitality in those terms, 
Do you feel something rise up within you? Say, Lord, sharing a meal, just eating together, doing it often. That doesn't sound so hard. We have a meal every day. I could ask someone to come and be with me in that. What a powerful tool that is, though, to bless our neighbors. Can you see how God might use that to open hearts, open lives, and through that relationship, begin to invite them to come and experience all of that? I found it fascinating as this series has unfolded. This was God's timing that today we would talk about this topic, eat together often, and it just happens to be Communion Sunday. Interesting. Jesus, as he took those elements of communion, not only reminded his disciples of how God delivered Israel, but he said, I want you to understand the significance of what God has done to deliver his people. And so he took the elements of communion, Passover, and said, let me help you understand what's about to happen as he describes the cross and God's love and that God would rescue us from our sin. As we come this morning to those communion elements, may we partake together being reminded of what we've received from Christ. And even as we partake those elements and we're reminded that Christ did this for us, he's saying, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And so even as we extend hospitality to our neighbors, we have the opportunity to help them understand this is what Christ did on the cross. This was his great love for us. May we practice this in a very practical way, simply eating together often. It's how we bless our neighbors.